We all live in Peter Thiel's world. From business, to technology, to politics, he's used his massive wealth to shape society and control your life. And he wants even more power. In 2022, Thiel's investment in hand-picked far-right candidates, some of whom he nurtured for years, shaped the narrative for the entire election. J.D. Vance will be the next Republican senator of victory for Peter Thiel, who spent millions backing J.D. Vance. But Thiel wasn't always on top of the world. In 1996, Peter Thiel was lost, a law school graduate and the author of a middling book on the dangers of diversity. The problems of racism, sexism, other forms of oppression have been vastly exaggerated. But then he found something, venture capital. In just a few short years, Thiel took a million dollar investment from friends and family and created a massive amount of wealth for himself. Lots of tech founders say they're going to change the world. It's a big part of the VC shtick. But Thiel is different. Our goal was nothing less than to replace the US dollar by creating a new digital currency. For him, it wasn't about making a pitch sound good to investors. It was about using the philosophy of venture capital investing to forcibly shape the world to his liking. And the world Peter Thiel wants to create is chilling and rooted in VC philosophy. Monopolization, anti-democratic ideology, and absolute power for corporations over American working people. This is The Classroom from More Perfect Union, and today we're looking at how Peter Thiel got rich and what it means for the rest of us. Growing up, Peter Thiel was like a classic nerd trope, obsessed with D&D and sci-fi. Not just Star Wars and Star Trek, but the real stuff. Clark, Asimov, Heinlein. He was a chess star and the head of the math team. Thiel's good grades and familial wealth earned him a spot at Stanford University for undergrad and law school, where he got into his first venture, an alternative student newspaper aimed at conservatives, the Stanford Review. The publication was Thiel's response to what he perceived as a takeover by the politically correct. It seemed designed to offend, calling the school's sexual assault regulations too strict, excoriating diversity initiatives, and attacking anything that questioned Western culture. The review was the beginning of Thiel's later network. Many of the students who wrote for or staffed the far-right newspaper would end up as Thiel's future business partners. Stanford is also where Thiel was introduced to philosopher and professor René Girard, who influenced Thiel's worldview. Girard wrote about how humans intently imitate each other, and how that holds society back. He specifically pointed to humans' competitive nature holding back scientific and technological progress. Thiel really connected with this viewpoint, and it fueled his belief that monopolies are actually a good thing. If you're a startup, you know, you want to get to Monopoly. You're starting a new company, you want to get to Monopoly. Before graduating, Thiel wrote one last op-ed for the review, where he said that the PC alternative to greed is not personal fulfillment or happiness, but anger at and envy of people who are doing something more worthwhile. So what was more worthwhile to Thiel? The money business. Peter joined up with a few young engineers building a new way to send payment digitally, pretty revolutionary in the late 90s. The company started as Confinity, a play on infinite confidence. It briefly became X.com, as partner Elon Musk insisted, but eventually became PayPal. Staffing up, Thiel recruited some of his friends from the Stanford Review. The anarcho-capitalist views of that contingent were essential in the founding of PayPal, he explained at Libertopia 2010. The initial founding vision was that we were going to use technology to change the whole world and basically overturn um, the monetary system of the world. We could never win an election on getting certain things because we were in such a small minority. But maybe you could actually unilaterally change the world without having to constantly convince people and beg people and plead with people who are never going to agree with you through technological means. And this is where I think um, technology is this incredible alternative to politics. You might think of PayPal today as a harmless mechanism for buying vintage movie posters on eBay, but the real goal was to completely destroy the global order of currency. Well, we need to take over the world. We can't slow down now. In a PayPal all-hands meeting in 2001, Thiel told staff, the ability to move money fluidly and the erosion of the nation state are closely related, as they were building a system to move money fluidly. But just a few months later, Thiel took the money and ran. PayPal went public with an IPO. We were the first company in the US to file after 9-11. Shortly after, PayPal sold to eBay. Thiel's 3.7% stake in the company was worth $57 million. What happens when you give a guy who wants to remake the world into one that follows his own twisted political vision $57 million? Well, it's not great. 
Look at his investment in Patry Friedman, a young Google engineer, pickup artist blogger, amateur model, and grandson of Milton Friedman. Which, don't get us started on Milton Friedman. But Patry had a big idea. Build artificial islands at sea to house lawless libertarian utopias. Peter Thiel got wind of this and offered Friedman $500,000 to quit his job at Google and get started on the project. Thiel truly saw starting new nations as the same as starting companies. Really, he said it. Just like uh, there's a room for uh, starting new companies, because not all existing companies solve all the problems we need to solve, I think there, is also, uh, there should also be some room for trying to start um, new countries, new governments. But starting countries is difficult. What if you start over in a new country, uh, some African country with a few billion dollars, and build, a, build it from the ground up? We've looked at this. Uh, we've looked at all these possibilities. Um, I think the basic challenges are that uh, it's not that easy to get the country. Uh, you might have, it's your, you, you might not want to be stuck with the people you already have. Um, and then, um, and then actually, you know, the basic infrastructure may actually cost quite a bit more. You want to do something that works much more incrementally and organically. Friedman eventually left the Seasteading Institute, and Thiel's involvement seemed over. But let's look at the last part of that quote do something that works much more incrementally and organically. After giving up on starting a brand new country, Thiel set about refashioning the country he already lived in. This is how Peter Thiel used the venture capital mindset to seize political power. Presumably to the chagrin of Thiel's friends at Libertopia, he immediately got involved with the CIA. His next company was Palantir, a surveillance and data tech outfit, and seed funding came from Inqtel a non-profit venture capital firm dedicated to funding projects that would be helpful to the CIA. The firm isn't officially run by the CIA, but there is a revolving door of staff between the two, and the firm is colloquially referred to as the CIA's private equity firm. Palantir eventually did help the CIA, and the FBI, and the CDC, and a host of other governmental organizations that would have gotten Teal booed right out of Libertopia. But to Thiel, it didn't matter that he didn't live in some anarcho-capitalist utopia, because he was building his own using his enormous wealth. Thiel exploited systems within the existing libertarian but only for billionaires system. Like his tax trick. ProPublica unveiled in 2021 that much of Thiel's wealth is held in a Roth IRA, a type of tax-free investment fund meant for retirement. The amount you're allowed to contribute is capped at a few thousand dollars a year. But in 1999, Thiel turned $2,000 he had in his account into PayPal stock, an investment which paid off. When Thiel was the first large investor in Facebook, that half a million dollar angel investment, immortalized by this guy who looks nothing like Thiel in the social network, was just a restructuring of his tax-free retirement fund. He can eventually withdraw the over $5 billion in the account tax-free. The average IRA has .000, 008% of that. Teal's Libertopia friends have to pay high taxes, but Teal won't on a large portion of his wealth. Then there's litigation financing. The ultra-rich can actually gamble on court cases. They fund legal fees for a lawsuit, then take a percentage of the winnings if they pick the right side. It's completely legal, and Teal used it to silence free speech. After Gawker, an online news and blogging outlet, outed Teal as gay, he set his eyes on destroying them. When Gawker posted a shadily acquired sex tape of wrestler Hulk Hogan, Teal bankrolled Hogan's lawsuit against the publication. Gawker was bankrupted, and Teal made a profit. Teal uses his inordinate wealth and investment principles to get richer, to destroy the free speech of others, and to live in his own libertarian paradise. Another big investment area is in ideas. Pretty chilling ones. Let's look at the Dark Enlightenment movement, which Quartz calls an obscure neo-fascist philosophy, and media researcher David Columbia calls the worship of corporate power to the extent that corporate power becomes the only power in the world. One of the movement's loudest voices is blogger Curtis Yarvin. Thiel has invested heavily in Yarvin startups, basically funding a big portion of the Dark Enlightenment movement, and it's obvious the movement mirrors Thiel's beliefs. Complete corporate control. And two of his assets, long-term investments he's been nurturing for years, could help that goal. 2022 Senate candidates J.D. Vance and Blake Masters. Both of them worked for Teal firms, and he's been bolstering their careers this whole time, supporting their projects along the way. Vance and Masters are long-term Teal investments. As an investor entrepreneur, I've always tried to be contrarian, to go against the crowd, to identify opportunities that, in places where people were not looking. 
And they're just two of the far-right candidates Thiel invested in in 2022. He's been donating big for years in order to further his political goal, a corporate-ruled utopia for billionaires. He's also investing in tech companies that will help his dark political project, like Rumble, a free speech-focused social network populated almost entirely by the far right. So if Thiel is treating politics like investing, what can his investment strategies teach us about what's to come? Well, the guy loves monopolies. I have a single idée fixe that I'm completely obsessed with in, um, on, on the business side, which is that uh, if you're starting a company, if you're the founder, entrepreneur starting a company, you always want to aim for monopoly. And, um, and, that, uh, and you want to always avoid competition. And so, uh, hence, uh, competition is for losers, uh, something we'll be talking about today. What does it mean when a nation is ruled by a monopoly? One single all-powerful entity? Well, let's just say it's not a democracy. There should also be some room for trying to start new countries. And that country would have a complete lack of accountability for the ultra-rich. Get rid of government regulation of technology. Allow us to build nuclear power. Allow us to, you know, go into space, have supersonic planes again. Allow us to um, get rid of the FDA. Peter Thiel doesn't need to build an island to have his libertarian dreamland. He can build it right here in America. And he already is. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe. We'll be covering the stories of other billionaires and multimillionaires to examine the policy failures that made them rich, as well as the worker-empowering stories and explainers you're used to.